Um, so, first of all, uh, welcome to the briefing on the Police Crime Sentencing of Courts Bill Part 4, organised by the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Gypsies, Travellers and Roma. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, I'm going to assume yes and, and, uh, and carry on. We've got a tight, a tight schedule for the, for the meeting. I'm Andy Slaughter, I'm the Labour MP for Hammersmith, currently Vice Chair of the APPG uh, and involved with the APPG and its predecessor since I was elected in 2005 and Egyptian travel issues for many years before that, both as a councillor and a, uh, as a lawyer. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, SMP MP Martin Dr Hughes, who's just been re-elected as, as the Chair of the uh, APPG, the All-Party Parliamentary Group. I'd like to thank friends, families and travellers who support the group, especially Abby Kirby and her colleagues, without whom today none of our activities would be possible, and the Joseph Browntree Trust, who support the, the work of uh, uh, friends, families and travellers and the APPG. I should say the only reason I'm chairing today, rather than Martin, is that the subject of the briefing and much of the bill applies to England and Wales, but not Scotland. Um, we have some impressive speakers in the next 40 minutes, and I feel guilty in asking them to keep their contributions within tight limits, but that is because I also want to hear from the equally impressive audience. So we will start with Chris Johnson of Community Law Partnership, one of the leading experts in the law as it affects gypsy and traveller communities, and along with Mark Willis, QC of Garden Court Chambers, so I hope to also hear a regular challenger of anti-traveller laws in the courts. Chris will explain what the bill proposes in part four and how this could affect the rights of travellers. Then Violet Cannon, director of York Traveller Trust and chair of the Moving for Change board will speak about the threat to communities posed by the bill, but also some positive proposals to maintain the rights to travel. And finally, uh, in that section, Sam Grant, head of policy and campaigns at Liberty will talk about the human rights issues in the bill. The uh, bill had its second reading, that is a debate around the principles of legislation in the House of Commons. Um, recently, the next stage will be detailed consideration in committee in May and June with an opportunity to discuss part four and to try and amend or even delete it. And after that, there are further common stages and we repeat the process in the Lords. So it'll be some months before there is any change in the law. Um, I won't say any more about that, as I'm glad to say, Sarah Jones, MP, who's the Shadow Home Office Minister, uh, has joined us and may wish to comment on how she sees the process in Parliament working, what the opposition's attitude to part four will be. I'm also very pleased to see we've got Deputy Chief Constable uh, Jeanette McCormack with us. Jeanette is the lead officer uh, on Gypsy and Traveller issues for the National Police Chiefs Council, and we'd be happy to hear from her. We've got in the audience representatives from the churches, the law, academics, NGOs like Rene Cassin, and most importantly from gypsies and travellers themselves and organisations including the Traveller Movement, LGBT Traveller Pride, London Gypsies and Travellers and the Gypsy Roman Traveller Police Association. Can I also mention, and I will undoubtedly miss some people because I'm not actually looking at the full list of participants at the moment, but I am just so impressed by the number of parliamentarians We've got joining us, I've seen Lady Hodgson, Baroness Bennett, Baroness Lister. Um, uh, I've seen Kate Green, of course, the, uh, the former distinguished chair of the APPG, uh, so a cabinet member, Rachel Maskell, Peter Bottomley, Deirdre Brock, Mary Foy, Ian Byrne, Alex Bell, Stephen Farry, Bambos, Cheryl Lambos, and I'm sure there are others as well. Thank you very much for, for giving your, your time up uh, today. Uh, I will try and squeeze as many comments and questions as possible into the last half hour, but we need to finish at 2.30. And finally, I'd say this, it, it'd be foolish to pretend that this bill is anything other than both punitive and regressive, or that uh, once again, we're seeing the targeting and scapegoating of gypsy and traveler communities. That is depressing, but what isn't depressing is the coming together of gypsy and traveler communities and their supporters, bringing a wealth of experience and expertise to combat these proposals, to raise awareness of the discrimination suffered by Roma Gypsy the Traveller, and to put the positive case for more sites and transit sites and better support from national and local government. For those who haven't had enough by 2.30 today, can I recommend 
that we are to you that we're debating the criminalization of trespass in the Commons this afternoon for 90 minutes as a result of a 135,000 signature petition opposing that. Martin, Dr. Hughes and Sarah Jones will be speaking for their respective parties as will a number of strong opponents of the bill. So if you want to, you can see that either on Parliament TV live or watch it or read it in Hansard later. So without any more advertisement for politicians talking, uh, can we now hear from the experts and begin with Chris Johnson, Community Law Partnership. And Chris, you have up to 20 minutes. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, can everyone hear me? Um, the um, first day apologies from Mark Willis, QC of Garden Court Chambers, who had hoped to, he might manage to dip in, but he's got a very early day of uh, a, a court casework, um, uh, so apologies from him. Community Law Partnership, for those who haven't come across us, are a legal aid firm, uh, uh, becoming a rare beast, legal aid firms, but they're a legal aid firm in Birmingham, and we have a specialised team um, who, who advise and represent gypsies and travellers throughout England and Wales. Um, as many people will be aware, the first consultation on the question of unauthorised encampments was in 2018, in fact, and then that was followed up by a further consultation um, in 2019. Eventually, the government, the Home Office responded uh, on the 8th of March, saying they were going to bring in these proposals, and the very next day the bill was introduced to Parliament. The government claimed their motivation uh, in um, bringing in these provisions in part four is to stop harm caused by unauthorized encampments. Um, some people may uh, speculate that uh, there might be a different motivation involved and uh, heaven forbid the motivation could be to uh, bring to an end uh, nomadism in um, England and Wales uh, for the first time since British gypsies, uh, since gypsies, I think, mind, gypsies arrived, they weren't British at that time, arrived um, on the shores of Britain in the early 16th century. Um, now, um, and, and uh, interestingly, uh, in a document, um, frequently asked questions that the Home Office put out. Uh, they did say that their view was that, um, that, that they should provide the police with sufficient powers to effectively and efficiently enforce against a range of harms caused by some unauthorised encampments, and then continued to say the offence and strengthen police powers could also deter unauthorised encampments from being set up in the first instance. So I think that might give away some alternative motivation there. Um, I think... Very briefly, it's important to know what we're talking about in terms of nomadism. We're, we're, we're talking about many gypsies and travellers who are on the roadside because there is a lack of anywhere for them to stop. There's a lack of any authorised pitches, whether those are transit or emergency or permanent or by means of neg the negotiated stopping policy that was promoted uh, very well by the organisation Leeds Gate. Um, so, and additionally, those on permanent sites who, who, who travel uh, traditionally and uh, seasonally, either for work purposes or to go to festivals or, or, or to visit family, who then, when they travel, find that there is nowhere uh, for them to stop. So that's that we're talking about. Um, I think the first uh, crunch moment, really, for um, nomadism um, in Britain was the introduction of the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act 1994. Uh, and um, the uh, powers, I will come briefly back to those powers, but the powers contained in that act were described by, in, in a, a case called Atkinson, Lincolnshire County Council ex Body Atkinson. Um, uh, I know that most uh, law cases are extremely boring to read, but that is actually uh, uh, unusual in that it's very interesting to read. And it was the judgment of Mr. Justice, Justice Sedley, later Lord Justice Sedley, 
and he described the powers in that act as draconic. Um, I would agree that those powers are draconic and therefore I struggle to find a word uh, that suits the powers that are being proposed in the current bill. Um, I had uh, better fill people in very briefly on what the current powers are and apologies to those who know these powers extremely well and I'll make it brief. There's section 61 of the 1994 Act where the police, importantly the police, uh, can decide if one of three criteria is met that they can ask uh, travellers to leave the land that they are on without permission. And of course travellers are moving on land without permission because of the uh, stopping of traditional places. Uh, ironically, uh, uh, probably a hundred years ago, it was much easier for Egyptian travellers to stop somewhere because there were lots of traditional places. They could stop on common land and so on. And it's much more difficult now. And therefore they might end up on more high, so-called, you could call them high profile sites through no fault of their own. Um, now the three criteria, um, if there's damage caused to the land, uh, importantly caused to the land, um, or if there's a threatening, abusive or insulting words to the occupier, or if there are six or more vehicles, and then the police might uh, take, um, serve them with a direction to leave under section 61. Um, importantly, those powers, those, those powers were ameliorated both by government guidance, which um, made clear, and by cases like the Atkinson case, which made clear uh, that the welfare needs of the Egyptian traveller concerned should be taken into account. And also the question of alternative locations should be looked at, possible alternative locations. And especially by very important guidance from the police themselves, originally from the Association of Chief Police Officers and now uh, the latest one is 2018 from the National Police Chiefs Council and uh, extremely important guidance, uh, which on the one hand says, uh, repeats the fact that the welfare circumstances must be taken into account before any decision is taken to evict. And also indicates this is rather to oversimplify the guidance, which is very detailed, um, that um, section 61 may need to be used if there's anti a very bad antisocial behavior or if there's criminal activity taking place, which fortunately is only in a minority of cases, uh, but in other circumstances it may be that that discretion of the police to use section 61 uh, does not need uh, to, be, to be used. And then the other alternative method for the police to evict an encampment under the 1994 Act is section 62A to E. Now that the most important part of that provision is that the police have to um, direct the travellers concerned to a suitable alternative pitch. And what that has meant over the years, over recent years, is that that is very rarely used because there are so few transit pitches. There has been a slight increase in transit pitches over the last year or two, but there are still, there's still very few and far between. Um, and um, so it, it has not been used, and, but I think that um, we're touching there on, some, on, 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 on the possible alternative answer to all of this when we talk about uh, accommodation, accommodation suitable for gypsies and travellers, in other words. So that's a very, very swift um, visit to the 1994 Act, and uh, then we um, have to look at um, the uh, powers that are proposed in the, uh, th this bill. And the, it starts off referring to a person aged 18 or over who's re referred to in the bill as P. And P is residing or intended to reside on land without the consent of the occupier, has at least one vehicle on the land. So to pause there, this is a, a, a vast increase in, in the powers. A, a single traveller, a single gypsy or traveller, travelling in one vehicle uh, can be caught by uh, these provisions. Um, 
And then there are certain uh, conditions uh, or, or criteria. And the first one is that they have to be asked to move. Now, unlike, and this is a very important one just to pause briefly on, unlike under section 61, where it, it, it is the police who decide whether they're going to ask them to move, under, under this provision, the police or the occupier or a representative of the occupier of the land can ask them to move. So that's the landowner or a leaseholder or a licensee of the land uh, can ask them to move. And we'll come back to why that is so important. Um, the offence is uh, committed if they uh, fail to leave the land or they re-enter the land within a prescribed period of time. And once again, there's been an increase here. The previous, the prescribed period of time under section 61 for not returning to the land was three months and the prescribed period here is 12 months, which is very significant given that there are so few places for Egyptian travellers to stop on. So you stop on a place, you're given a notice, you have to leave, you can't come back to that piece of land for 12 months, according to the bill. And then we have the conditions. And uh, there are uh, several conditions, I won't go through the whole lot. The basic condition is that P, or no doubt lots of P's, um, either have caused or are likely to cause. And again, just pause there. That's a very interesting and important new introduction, likely to cause um, either significant disruption or significant damage. Uh, 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 and if that um, criteria is met, um, then that they can be served with the notice and they can and they they have to go um, and additionally the another alternative is that significant distress uh, a new term in this area of the law distress um, has been caused or, or is like again likely to be caused uh, as a result of offensive conduct now there are several uh, problems with that, uh, to say the least. Um, first of all, can it really be, um, we would say, uh, can it really be proportionate or reasonable to impose um, such a thing on gypsies and travellers on the roadside when there are no places to send them to, or there are very few places to send them to, and in many, many areas, no places? Um, uh, so how 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 can how can how can that possibly be reasonable and proportionate uh, to use those powers when you can't direct them to somewhere where they'd be allowed to stay at least for a short period of time? Um, it also rather evades the government's positive obligation, uh, as enshrined, for example, in the European Court judgment in Connors v. the United Kingdom, uh, to protect gypsies and travellers' traditional way of life. And as recently mentioned in the very important Court of Appeal judgment in a case involving wide injunctions brought by certain local authorities against travellers, case of London Borough of Bromley v Persons Unknown, where Lord Justice Coulson said, finally, it must be recognised that the cases make plain that the Gypsy and traveller community have an enshrined freedom not to stay in one place, but to move from one place to another. An injunction, he's referring to injunctions there, um, which prevents them from stopping at all in a defined part of the UK comprises a potential breach of both the convention, that's the European Convention on Human Rights and the Equality Act, since gypsies and travellers are of course, um, recognised as ethnic groups. Um, interestingly, there, if you read the consultation paper, and there was great work done by FFT um, and Liberty in bringing together a large number of responses, and you'll see that Generally speaking, the majority of respondents in that consultation disagreed with these measures. And perhaps most importantly, and this comes out of research done by FFT and published last year, the police do not think these powers are necessary and do not, did not want these powers. Uh, but despite that, these powers are uh, being brought in. Um, and I would say, um, Really, most damningly, 
is what I would call the chilling effect of, of these powers if they're brought into force. And I can explain that by the three members of the team here, of, of which I'm one in CLP, who deal with gypsies and travellers, we envisaged how we would deal. We discussed how we would deal with the gypsy traveller phoning up. And this gypsy traveller is saying, um, the, let's say it's local authority land. A local authority officer has uh, arrived and said, I'm likely to cause significant damage or significant disruption or significant distress. And I must go in two hours time. But I don't agree with that. I don't think I am likely to do that. Uh, and I've never done it before. And therefore, I, I think this is outrageous. And we'll say to them, well, your, your way of challenging that would be to stay on that piece of land. But we have to warn you that um, if you stay on that piece of land, uh, you might be, and this, this is what will happen if people uh, commit the offence, you may be arrested and your vehicles, in other words, your homes, may be impounded. And that we're very happy if you want to risk that, and we're very happy to try and challenge that. Though given the vagaries of the legal aid system, it will probably take us at least two days to, if you, if you are financially eligible for legal aid, for, for us to get legal aid, if we ever get legal aid. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind hanging around for four, at least 48 hours, we'll see if we can challenge it, but you are taking that risk. And I would say that almost inevitably in those circumstances, the gypsy or traveller concerned will leave the land. Um, so, and, and additionally, the police, I think, will be in a very difficult position if I can try and envisage their position. Um, let's say the occupier of the land decides that there is likely to be significant. And again, what do these terms mean? There are, there, there are some, I won't take you to the, Please do look at the definitions in the bill of damage and um, disruption and uh, uh, distress, but um, it's never very clear of what does significant mean. Uh, it's all, always very difficult to, until there is a court case, which might um, help to hone in on what exactly does this mean. It's always very difficult to know what these terms are going to mean um, on, on the ground. So the police are contacted by the occupier of the land who says, I think that the criteria are satisfied. I've given a notice. I've asked them to leave. They, aren't, they haven't le left over to you. And the police may well feel obliged to take action, even though if they were in charge of the matter, um, they might approach it in a different way, or they may not agree that there's likely to be damage or disruption. Uh, so there will be a great deal of pressure on the police uh, to take action. And I think there'll be a great de deal of pressure on local authorities if these powers are brought in, for example, by certain, not all local residents, of course, but some local residents who object to an encampment being in place. Uh, there'll be a great deal of pressure on local authorities to take uh, action, or, or, or rather for local authorities to, to make that initial step serving the notice and then bringing in the police. Um, so I think this is really a very, very serious moment uh, for those gypsy and travellers who don't have authorised stopping places, who have to resort to the roadside through, through no uh, fault of their own, or who are carrying on their way of life by uh, travelling uh, to, to find work or, or to festivals, etc. And uh, this is a really big crunch moment. Now, we have already two clients um, who have uh, instructed us that if these powers are brought in, um, they want to challenge them in the courts. And uh, we're very happy to hear from all clients, sorry to do a bit of a plug there, who might want to phone us about this issue. But it would be far better if that didn't have to happen. It would be far better if part four did not appear uh, when this uh, bill becomes an act and was not in, in the act at all. And in, in that regard, I, I, I hope that the, and I know that the APBG will be working um, 
on these issues and, and trying to address the enormous problems um, that um, this part of the bill uh, presents to the gypsy and traveller community. Thank you very much. Uh, quick, th th thank you so much. It's, it's brilliant to get so much and so clearly into um, the, the time we've given you. Uh, I'm going to move on to Violet. Violet, are, are you with us? I I could see that you were there, but I couldn't I see your picture. Lovely. And you can even hear me. Um, I've introduced you already. I don't want to take more time. So uh, Violet Cannon, Director of York Traveller Trust, um, could we hear from you in about 10 minutes? Thank I'm you. going to try my best. I didn't plan on writing anything down because I felt that to speak on behalf of my family, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Gypsy and Traveller community, I'm speaking on behalf of my family and the clients that I know and work with um, up and down the country. So please, I'm not speaking on behalf of the community. Um, I was going to do it off the cuff, um, but I'll be honest, the more I thought about it, the more I think, I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can be calm and concise when I'm talking about something that affects my future, affects my family's future, affects my child's chance at living a life that I've lived. So I've tried to write something down really quickly. Um, so just bear with me, so I'm going to be reading off a screen. It's not something I'm comfortable with. I'm very much a seat of my pants type of person, so apologies. Violet Cannon, Director of York Travellers Trust and Chair of Moving for Change. So now my phone's going to decide it doesn't want to play ball. So homeless, um, I want to give you a little example of how this bill could impact upon first a homeless family. So it's a family that I work with in York. They're a homeless gypsy family and they have serious mental health issues. They have learning and comprehension difficulties and they were evicted from the local authority site because they have auditing tendencies also. This eviction from the local authority site means that they're excluded from most other local authority sites anywhere within the area. We've scoured everywhere around Yorkshire, despite the family being a York family and have never lived anywhere else. We've scoured Yorkshire for any local authority site that will take them. They won't. They've been evicted. They've essentially got an antisocial behaviour, even though those don't exist anymore. York has no private provision whatsoever for this family. There isn't a private site in York um, there's some around the outsides, but not in York itself, and none of them would take them because the family have lots of animals and collect scrap metal, and that's not allowed on many of the site licenses on the private sites surrounding York. So what York's currently doing at the minute is we're working on where we can go forward with this, and they're tolerating the family um, until we can find some sort of alternative provision. And that's really good. I really appreciate what York are doing with us there. However, under the new bill, the four members of the family could potentially face prison, prison. So that's the four adults within the family with serious mental health problems that aren't being supported would face prison. There would also be the fifth young person would, with serious mental health. She's bipolar and a couple of other conditions that I can't quite remember off the top of my head, but she would end up in the care system. Um, that would be four family members leaving the criminal justice system as actual criminals and street homeless because their homes would have been impounded. Their homes are worth maybe four or five hundred pounds at best. So by the time you've paid the impound fees, there's no caravan there. Another example, and I feel it's important that I give this example because this, this is my family's example. I don't have any homeless family that are living on the side of the road. But what I do have is a family that have lived nomadic lives for a long, long time. So my brother-in-law's grandmother dies. My sister packs out their house and puts it into their trailer for a few days down at the funeral. They arrived at their booked caravan club and they're turned away late in the evening because they're told that they can't come on because the caravan club does not allow those caravans and those vehicles on their parks. So they drive around for a bit looking for somewhere to sleep and they find a piece of land. The landowner has called the police and the police come and ask them to leave. Um, the landowner feels it's going to cause some significant distress to him if they don't leave. The family are angry, they're hurt, and they're in mourning. So they ask aggressively, where should we go? Tell us. Come on, tell us, mate, where are we going? The police can't answer, and my brother-in-law is talking animatedly, and so is my sister. They decide they're going to enact this bill. My 18-year-old niece, who we see as a child, she's not married, she's a baby, she's a child at 18, she starts screaming and starts begging the police to not arrest her mum and dad. All the children, there's five of them in total, start screaming at the same time. My brother-in-law, 
my sister and their eldest daughter are arrested for the first time in their lives are put in police custody. And the four children are probably taken into care for the evening. And that's best case for the evening. As we've already discussed, it's unlikely that it's going to be for the evening, especially if it's a weekend, they're there for a couple of days. Is that the best that we, as gypsy and traveller people, can expect? Is that what we're entitled to as a community that have lived in this country for so long? I've given two examples because I do feel it's important for you to understand that it's not just about not having enough provision for homeless families. That is a big issue. We've got 20% of the population that are currently homeless and we do need homes for them. But we also need to be looking at the people that we're letting down that choose to be nomadic through choice or necessity. What I'm asking for you today is to help us take a step back, a step back in time to when I was a child living on the roadside in the early 90s, a time when my family were not criminals simply because of the roof we chose to put over our heads, a time when local authorities spoke to us as individuals and when the media did not portray us as evil invaders and I did not have to bow and scrape to apologise for individuals who I don't know. I'd like to discuss negotiated stopping as one of the many options. And I will say one of the many options. Let's go back to my brother-in-law and put it against the negotiated stopping policy. The police turn up and say the owner of the land wants you to leave. My brother-in-law is no less distressed, he is no less angry. But when he asks the police, where should I go mate? Where am I going? Try to play by the rules, they won't have me on the caravan club. The police calmly explain that the local authority have identified a number of spaces for negotiated stopping. That if he would kindly put his caravan on the back of his vehicle and move 500 metres down the road, half a mile down the road, there is a piece of land where the local authority will come to you tomorrow, give you a piece of paper to sign, you'll sign it, they'll supply you with toilets and a bin for a couple of days and then you can be on your way. In my mind, there's no argument against which of these two is the better option obviously it's my family i'm talking about i guess what i want you to see is will you help us fight for it was that within 10 minutes <laughs> if only all speakers were as uh, disciplined as uh, as uh, as violet is looking particularly at my colleagues here but there it is that that's brilliantly evocative of some of the problems that, that Chris explained by it. Thank, thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be some questions for you, but can we move on now to our third formal speaker, who is Sam Grant, the Head of Policy and Campaigns for Liberty. So over to you, Sam. Thanks, Andy. Uh, firstly, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Thank you to Friends, Family, Travellers uh, and to the APPG for having this event. And thanks to Violet and to Chris for, for their excellent contributions. My name is Sam. I'm the head of policy and campaigns at Liberty. We're a human rights organization that's been uh, campaigning for a fairer society since the 1930s, um, which means that, that there's there's a lot of history that you can look back on uh, that Liberty have been involved in. And I had a quick look through some of Liberty's archives um, and you can see AGM motions uh, dating back to the 1960s. One caught my eye. Um, which was a, a motion expressing grave concern over the continuing plight of traveling people and gypsies who are still generally denied their civil right to a legal place to stay, the basic necessities for a decent life and prosecuted wherever they encamp. Now, I feel it, it's an indictment of this country and this government, um, but I'm sure also for many of you, it's exhausting that we're here today and we're able to make very similar if not the exact same statement that was made over 60 years ago but if there is one thing i would like the gypsy roman traveler communities to know and all the parliamentarians here today is that liberty will continue to partner to support and be an ally of the traveler community in the face of systemic racism whether this gov current government believes systemic racism exists or not now the police crime and sentencing and courts bill that we're talking about today is an attack on the traveler way of life. Um, but as you know, it, it is a bill that is over 300 pages long uh, with multiple areas of concern. 
Uh, if this bill is passed as it currently stands, it will reshape the right to protest and it will further tip the balance of power um, in, in favour of the government. And not only does this bill contain authoritarian powers, such as handing the police greater powers on where, when and how people can protest, it also ramps up sentencing and will funnel people into the criminal justice system, um, as Violet quite well put. The provisions in this bill will affect everyone. They'll affect individuals who now might may find themselves subject to 10-year prison sentences for minor offences um, or the prospect of um, constant and suspicion of stop and search. Um, and, and importantly, this bill will dismantle hard-won and deeply cherished rights to assemble, express dissent and protest. And this government's agenda is one that is allergic to accountability and hostile to human rights. And we're seeing simultaneous attacks on the public's ability to hold the state account uh, in the courts uh, through uh, attacks on judicial review and the Human Rights Act. Um, and Chris already referred to um, difficulties around legal aid. Uh, we're also seeing uh, it's getting increasingly hard for parliamentarians to hold the state to account in parliament. Um, through vast swathes of law being made by secondary legislation, which receives less scrutiny. Um, and now in this bill, uh, we're seeing the very ability to protest our concerns and hold the state to account on the streets made much harder. Now, the cumulative effect of all these measures, which target the tools that make protest rights meaningful, constitutes an attack on fundamental building blocks of our democracy, and it's a deeply direct deeply concerning direction to be heading in. But to talk specifically as, in a bit more detail about the section on, on trespass and the attack on the travel community, um, Chris and Violet both, both spoke, spoke to this very well, but clause 61 of the bill amends part five of the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act. Um, it creates this new offense of res residing on land without consent in or with a vehicle um, this broad proposal not only captures the act of res residing uh, or having a vehicle, but also the intention to reside or have a vehicle on land. Uh, moreover, the offence may be tri triggered for the cause um, or likelihood of causing significant damage, disruption or distress, um, which you know, Chris covered, but we can really see the, the breadth of activity that this might sweep up um, and those questions of proportionality and reasonableness um, really, really need to be asked and interrogated. Um, the bill also um, prevents the person from returning to a site within a period of 12 months. Um, person found guilty of this offence will also face uh, criminal punishments, including up to three months in jail, a fine of two and a half grand, um, and uh, and the the uh, potential of the vehicle being seized, which means the very real threat of travellers having their homes removed and finding themselves homeless. If that wording wasn't worrying enough, we, we can see already that some MPs are adding amendments to make these provisions even more punitive. While the impact will most keenly be felt by travel communities, we also know that there are lots of right to roam groups, access to the countryside groups, who are really concerned about the impact on the ability to access the countryside, there are homeless charities concerned about the impact that this might have on um, people who are rough sleeping or find themselves homeless. Um, and also these regulations will have a knock on effect on to protest camps, uh, which is an issue that connects uh, the protest elements of the bill um, and the trespass parts of the bill. Now, Chris has already mentioned, but I really think it's worth reiterating that we know from the great work of friends, families and travellers that the overwhelming majority, 75% of police responses to the 2018 consultation on unauthorised encampments indicated that the current powers were sufficient and proportionate and that 84% of police forces did not support the criminalisation of unauthorised encampments and 65% said lack of site provision was a real problem. Now the current proposals clearly fail to acknowledge that there is a that there is insufficient site provision, nor are there any proposals 
to address this problem. And um, going, going back to the, the, the consultation from, from last year that we work closely with friends, family and travellers to get people to respond and, and send in their, their concerns. Um, of the 26,000 uh, respondents, over 26,000 respondents, um, a total of just over 15,000 of those came from Liberty and Friends Family Travellers, all opposing um, this, this legislation. Now, going forward, Liberty will, Liberty will be working closely with a, with a really broad coalition to oppose these measures. Um, we'll be urging the government to abolish these proposals, um, both on trespass and on, on the protest elements. We really have been heartened by the mass opposition to this bill. We're seeing hundreds of thousands of people signing petitions and protests will continue uh, to happen and only grow as the bill returns and makes its way through Parliament. We must aim to show that breadth and depth of the coalition mobilising against this bill from friends, family, travellers, to Liberty, to Sisters Uncut, um, to Ramblers UK and the RSPCB. Um, we need to show that the government have bit, bitten off more than they can chew, because we know that this bill will compound inequalities, push people into the criminal justice system and disproportionately affect minority and ethnic communities. This bill is an attack on the traveller community. It is also an attack on all our fundamental rights to stand up for what we believe in and we'll be doing everything we can to oppose it. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you very much, Sam, for those uh, very in encouraging words. Um, uh, can I just say, I'm, I'm, I am not put anybody on the spot, but I did say there were two people I would ask to give a brief um, response to what we've heard so far, um, uh, who, who uh, Sarah Jones and uh, Jeanette McCormick. While they're doing that, the next, three or four minutes. Um, if anybody has any questions, I think that not to tax my technical abilities too much, if you either put your question or that you want to ask a question, just that in the chat, or possibly put up the, the large silly looking yellow thumb from your reactions menu. Um, I will try and do it that way. Probably easier if you just put questions in the chat and I'll get through as many as possible. So while people are thinking of, uh, of that, are there questions, questions and, and who you'd like to respond to them or, or comments, but brief comments if, if we can. Um, Sarah, if, if you're still there, um, I mentioned that you're in charge from the opposition side of, of the bill um, in committee. Did you want to say anything in response to what you've heard so far? Um, thanks, um, Andy. Um, I'll just be be very brief. I mean, firstly, thanks Andy for introducing me to Abby, who um, <laughs> say is, has been incredibly helpful uh, in this process. And and thanks to to all the organisations and the, the the people here today. I spoke to Sam last week um, from Liberty, and 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 I'm gathering our case. Um, and you make it very easy um, <laughs> for us because you've given us such good briefings and really, really um, welcome those. So the committee's probably going to be after the Queen's speech um, and uh, before the kind of summer recess, uh, there'll be a series of evidence sessions. Most of the bill is um, from the Ministry of Justice side. So that's being led by colleagues of mine, but the Home Office elements are being led by by me and 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 this is in the home office bit as as is the protest section so we're opposing um obviously um and i'm just carrying on having conversations with with abby and with others about how we do that in terms of um at what point and and if we try and put down amendments um as opposed you know, we're opposing completely but do we at this stage try and put amendments down to improve it or do we wait for it for the for further stages to do that so that we're kind of clean as it were in terms of our, our approach to, to the committee stage um and are there um on the kind of more um proactive um elements that we 
we want to be pushing are there amendments on you know the provision of of um uh, uh of local authority sites and uh, you know are there things that we can we can do to try and push a, a more proactive um response as well so so just very grateful for any thoughts from any colleagues on the on the call uh, as as always and we'll carry on um talking with abby and others about how we sort of approach the tactics of it but very much uh, appreciative of all the information we've we've had which is incredibly useful and we will do everything we can to persuade the government to change their mind um at committee stage there's a small group of mps from each party um and it's divided by the kind of you know uh, uh, alongside the 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 the, the, the majority within parliament so we we won't have a majority at, at committee stage um in terms of people opposing but we will try and make the moral and the practical cases of which there are several um and see if we can get the government to 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 shift um obviously then it goes elsewhere and and perhaps in the lords we might be um more um more successful because we have been previously um in recent times more successful at, at, at making sensible changes to legislation in the law um but yes thank you very much and do keep sending me any anything that you have that you think might might help us to make make this case uh, that, th thanks for that uh, sarah and uh, it's very good to hear that you're you're listening and, and thanks very much for the the stance that, that you and indeed the other front benches lib dem smp and others have, have taken so far on this um, uh, now, Jeanette McCormack, as a serving senior police officer, you perhaps can't be quite as a frank as, um, as some of our, our speakers have been, but I think particularly in relation to the points that Chris made about the practicalities of enforcing either the current or a prospective law, is there anything that you, you would be able to, to tell us today? Uh, Andy, if I could just um, jump in there on behalf of Jeanette. Jeanette is listening and they can hear this um, uh, the entire meeting but she she's at home where, where currently a great deal of building work is going on and if um, if she unmuted herself you wouldn't hear very much apart from that so my name's uh, Mark Watson I uh, support Jeanette in her role as um, NPCC lead for Gypsy Roman and Traveller Issues and she's asked if I just say a few words now if that's okay yeah. with with yeah. everybody uh, I know many of the people on the call and hopefully uh, lots of you will know me I work for Cheshire um, Constabulary. I was a police officer for 30 years. I'm now retired, but I'm a, a member of police staff, as it were, and I'm still obviously working to support Jeanette in, in this role, which she's held for some 10 years, which is uh, uh, quite a long time in portfolio terms for, um, for a senior officer, but it's it very helpful in terms of uh, keeping some continuity in, uh, in this respect. Uh, Chris mentioned very, very rightly the, the NPCC um, official position about this. When the, uh, the 2019 and the 2018 consultations were published, and indeed any consultations before that. Our position has been that we we were not in favour of making trespass a criminal offence. We were entirely happy with the existing powers as was, and we didn't see the need uh, for things to change. Obviously, what's in the bill is um, is completely different to that. There are some minor amendments to existing legislation as well, but there's a third main element to the bill as well, which we see as quite to uh, quite interesting in that one section of this new uh, this new part of the bill says the Secretary of State, and that must be the Home Secretary in this case, must issue guidance relating to the exercise of these powers. And that's, it actually uses the word must, not may do or could, must issue guidance in relation to the exercise of these powers. And police officers who exercise them must have regard to that guidance uh, when that happens. So I'll come back to that in, in a second. That's a very, uh, that's a very, crucial sort of section of it, really. In terms of what um, NPCC and others can do, obviously um, our um, submission to the consultation is entirely open and lots of people here will have, uh, will have seen it. We weren't in favour, but what, what do we do now? What is the next position? As, um, as Andy said, obviously we as the police um, enforce legislation that governments give us. Uh, when there's a consultation, we can certainly give our uh, opinions freely as we did. Obviously now we're in this position where this legislation may become more. Obviously we are somewhat more limited in um, in what we can do in terms of that. We're not a, a campaigning organisation in that sense, but obviously our position is well uh, well known and understood. In terms of how we um, we go forward from here now, we've, we've had a meeting um, a week last Friday with 
members of Jeanette's uh, Gypsy Roma Traveller Working Group, which comprises police officers and police staff from many, many forces around the country, basically to decide how best uh, we deal with this uh, from now on and where we uh, go from here. We, as uh, Chris again mentioned, we have some NPCC guidance or operational advice, as it's called now, which the 2018 version obviously would be made redundant pretty much immediately if this new legislation came in. So what's it, what, we, what can we do? How do we amend that guidance? Well, having mentioned that the Secretary of State must issue some guidance, what uh, we want to do in the first instance is obviously speak to the Home Office in terms of what that guidance may look like and hopefully have some role in informing and shaping that guidance as to how this legislation is in force. The legislation as written is incredibly open to interpretation. Chris made this, uh, this case very clear. There's lots of clauses in there about residing or intending to reside, all those sorts of things. Uh, has a vehicle with you or intends to have a vehicle with you. So when exactly is the is the uh, the offence committed in terms of um, uh, in terms of this significant? Uh, what is significant damage, disruption, or distress? And indeed, perhaps most crucially of all, who defines what is considered you know significant damage, disruption, or who has the final say in what they uh, in, in the interpretation of those things. So, I mean, all of that is very much open to question, depending how you uh, you read the legislation. In simple police terms, we, we've been asking sort of questions up to this point of when when actually then would an offence be committed that a force might have to record in that um, in that way. And it is incredibly difficult for us to see exactly where that uh, where that line is drawn at the moment. Um, there's all sorts of there's uh, parts of the bill about her. Uh, you can, if you have a reasonable excuse uh, not to leave as soon as reasonably practicable. Well, what is a reasonable excuse? Is a reasonable excuse that there frankly isn't anywhere else that you could possibly go, and that is such a massive issue as um, as Chris um, says absolutely absolutely rightly. The biggest issue in respect of unauthorized encampments is the lack of uh, sufficient provision uh, already. Uh, for anywhere for people to go to, and that is the biggest uh, the biggest problem. Um, I can see all sorts of issues looming in the future about some um, uh, equality issues with this. I mean, a nomadic lifestyle is an absolutely integral part of Gypsy Roma Traveller sort of communities. Many people do live more settled lives now, but obviously that nomadic tradition is is absolutely essential. And I, it's difficult to see how this piece of legislation is aimed at anybody else apart from this one small group, which surely is something that's going to be challenged at some point in the cycle if this were to become law. Obviously, it's not at the moment. So, um, so there we are. In a nutshell, that's um, what we're looking to do. We're, we're trying to speak to the, the Home Office. We'd also love to speak to the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government, who apparently have reinvigorated the uh, the cross-governmental strategy to tackle inequalities suffered by these communities, or that's what we're uh, that's what we're hearing. That was announced well over 18 months ago now, and we haven't seen any actual sort of product of that yet. But it does seem entirely out of balance to bring in this legislation by the Home Office, when on the other hand, the CLG are supposedly developing a strategy to tackle inequalities suffered by these communities. If that really is the case, those two pieces of work need to come together in some way, shape or form, um, we think. We certainly need to talk to the Home Office about the uh, the guidance, the Home Secretary's guidance in whatever form that may take. Uh, difficult at the moment, obviously, Police and Crime Commissioner elections loom on the 6th of May. So I think talking to, um, to civil servants prior to that is probably going to be out of the question, but certainly post that um, post that period will do that. And, and I noticed somebody, somebody raised a question in the chat a short time ago about some um, the position in Wales and obviously the Welsh government have already indicated that they're going to take a slightly different position to um, uh, to the English one in terms of in terms of this again Welsh government elections take place on the 6th of May the entire government is up for re-election I understand so um, we'll, we'll not see the full the full range of issues there until after that date but that's um, in a nutshell that's where we are we are within the MPCC talking to each other and trying to talk to everybody else in the hope that we can um, we can try and have some influence on where this goes from here. Mark, thank you very much. That's incredibly helpful. And thank you for, for, for stepping in for Jeanette. We wish her luck with the builders. What I'm going to do because of the, of the limited time, I'm going to go through the questions 
I'll read them out when we've got questions and I will ask people to briefly speak to them when they've just so they have a question. And if our three main speakers could just make a note of those they want to comment on, and we've got five minutes to go, I'll come back and ask them to go through them. If I go take it one at a time and go through a panel, we just won't get through it through enough. So apologies for that. But the, the, the first here is Trudy Aspinwall. We've just heard Wales mentioned by Mark. Trudy, what's your question? Thanks, Andy. Um, I'll be brief. Um, it's a bit of a comment as well, which is just to say that um, I, I guess some people will be aware, but this, these proposals um, are a direct juxtaposition of the legal position in Wales. We have a Housing Act in Wales, which puts a duty on local authorities to provide both permanent residential and sufficient transit provision for gypsy and traveller communities we could find ourselves or Chris could find himself in a situation of um, uh, families ringing us up and um, uh, being faced with eviction under these powers yet the local authority have failed in their duty and are actually the ones breaking the law themselves by not having provided um, uh, pictures for, for this family and some families obviously are in camp for long periods of time so whilst we have this duty in Wales it's um, taking a long time to actually um, have a positive impact on families with new pitches are still fairly slow. So we have that situation in Wales and I think I'm really interested to look at and to have views about how we might be able to challenge and mitigate against um, this bill from a Welsh perspective um, and um, the Welsh Government in their recent Race Equality Action Plan that's just been published for consultation, they have acknowledged that this is a systemic and racist piece of legislation and they have made a commitment to um, specifically to um, challenging it and they're looking to disapply it is what they have they have published as well as to look at mitigating the effects by what they can do through better accommodation provision and and, and all the other provisions that, that need to happen so you know we're, we're lucky that in Wales that, that that lead is coming from Welsh Government but I'm keen to know what and to join with others really in both supporting the position um, the challenge in England but also what we can do in Wales. Thank you very much. As I said, I'll come back to the to, to answers. I think some of these will be for Chris if they're more technical legal questions. Um, there's quite a comment from Mike Doherty to say to know that there are some very there is some very strong opposition to this and linking this to the two two big London Kill the Bill rallies so far uh, organised by coalition, including Extinction Rebellion and Stand Up to Racism, and lots of support, and linking part four with part three, which is the criminalisation and control of um, free speech and, and association. Um, uh, there's a question from the uh, National Bargees Travel Association. Um, good to see you here, as a Grand Union MP. Um, uh, so we're very concerned that Canal and River Trust and other navigation authorities riparian landowners, both public and private, including local authorities, will find a way to us uh, to use the proposed powers to evict boat dwellers. I don't know. Did you want to add anything to that? Uh, or do you just like to get a comment? Um, yes, a couple of questions. I don't want to add anything to the question, but we'd be very grateful for anything, any comments or answers or clarifications. Thank you. Uh, Ruth Lister, uh, Ruth Lister, a question about likely to cause. Um, Ruth, can we hear that? Yeah, sorry, just having a coughing fit. <coughs> um, I'm not a lawyer, but I just wondered whether this phrase likely to be caused, uh, do we have much experience of this in other legislation and what effect has it been? Because it seems to me so open to, to interpretation. I think going back to what Mark said, I'm thinking particularly uh, likely to cause significant distress. Well, yes. I mean, if you've got someone who's very racist and anti-gypsy traveller Roma population, the, the very fact of being there is likely to cause them significant distress. But to, to make that a criminal act just seems extraordinary. That, that, thank you, Ruth. Um, uh, a question from uh, Luke Benman. Hello again, Luke. Um, could you put your question? Yeah, so 
my question is about the fact that this power gives the police extra powers to deal with families like mine and lots of relatives of mine who are still on the road. Um, I just wanted to highlight the amount of police brutality we've historically faced. And we've also faced a lot of discrimination from serving police officers, including met police officers in Facebook groups and, um, you know, people being attacked by police dogs, almost losing their legs, uh, gypsy and traveler women being dragged across playing fields when they've got epilepsy and they're pregnant. I just want to highlight the fact that this is going to be up to the discretion of some of those same police officers that have brutalized families like mine for generations. And they're now going to have the power and their discretion to seize our property and our vehicles. I just wanted to know, um, you know, what, what's, what's going to be suggested to, to make sure that there's going to be some proper, you know, checks and balances on that. I mean, the, what they're proposing is racist as it is, but how are we going to make sure that these police officers, some of them, I'm not saying all police officers, I wouldn't say that, but, you know, we do face a lot of systemic discrimination from, you know, serving police officers and, and, and you know, council workers and things like that. How are we going to make sure that, you know, our vehicles and our homes and things aren't going to be seized and we aren't going to be even more brutalized than we already are. You only have to look back to the eviction of Dale Farm to sheer, to see the sheer brutality in which we are dealt with. And it's actually a myth to say that the police don't police us properly. If anything, we're over policed and we're over represented in the criminal justice system. Uh, what, one thing I just want to add very quickly is the fact that why do we deserve less humanity? Why do we deserve not deserve somewhere to live and not deserve a roof over our head what makes us less deserving um that's it really and they say that we're predisposed to criminality and culturally criminal well how is the law that's making our very existence criminal how is that solving any of those you know supposed cultural problems well it's not it's just making it you know awful and worse and some of my relatives might lose their children over this bill so I just want to make sure that everybody knows what's at stake here. They are grieving mothers, you know, mothers that will be screaming and their children will be snatched from them. And that's the sort of level of brutality we're looking at. This is sponsored state violence. Anyway, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you very much, Luke, for putting that so clearly. And uh, Father Dan Mason raising another jurisdiction, that the, uh, the differences between this legislation and the Irish government legislation, which criminalised trespass, which some of you are familiar with. Did you want to add anything to that? Just to say that I'm a parish priest in Billericay in, in Essex, and a number of the uh, Essex MPs have been proposing the Irish option, which is what they, they describe. And I was wondering if, what the difference is between the legislation being proposed and what the Irish government brought in to criminalise trespass. Okay, I'll be coming back to, to Chris on that. He's got to be an expert in all jurisdictions now. Uh, uh, and the next person I've got is uh, Tyler, a uh, uh, question about the practicalities of the powers. Yeah, thank you. Because uh, we've heard a lot of quite impassioned and very um, important testimony of how it would affect people individually and uh, the fear that that puts into us now, especially because the bill itself, uh, despite being, as we've said, so enormous, um, is quite lacking in the detail that would get us to have a sense of what it would be like for me in the real world. Um, and so the, one of the kind of practicalities was just like, because we've had these talks about what it means for us in the fear, but I don't think that's going to win us the argument in Parliament, because I don't think that the people that have already, you know, they voted exactly along the party lines and it doesn't sound greatly like they care very much about these arguments. So I wondered whether leaning on the practical side of things was a better way. And yeah, you know, sort of, if someone is nomadic the entire year round um, and they return within a year, is what's, what's the process for ascertaining that it's exactly the same family? Uh, what's that, <clears throat> you know, and so how is that gonna work? Or is that just gonna be open to um, a sort of discriminatory process of a policeman saying, oh yeah, they've been here before? And is um, if they're going to be impounding vehicles and things, the, the the cost involved because most standard police cars don't have couplings, so you'd need to you need to get a kind of special recovery type van in, and just all of the you know the children having to be taken into care because all of the adults are done. The amount of cost that it would involve to enforce something like this seems so 
unhelpful and sort of, I feel I feel those are the arguments that you would more likely win friends on and the other one is just because it's gone down to one vehicle it is now as illegal to have one vehicle as it is to have 50. So back in you know back not long ago you know when it was sort of five or six the point is like well encampments were small and manageable actually now this is a this is a license too well we might as well bring everybody and so it's going to be more of a problem because and the, the more of like a kind of safety and numbers thing so i think those are the arguments that are better um because i just don't feel like the people that are going to vote for this bill are going to listen very much to how frightening it is thank you um, th th thank you uh, very very much a very good point tyler the um there's another point on definition um, you know, what's the definition reside in, in the context of the bill? What length of time does it cover? Um, uh, a, a, me a message from uh, a message from Betty Billington to say that shelter is intending to, as homelessness was mentioned, to amend the bill to clarify that it's not. It's pretty clear that the bill is written in a way to target uh, gypsies and travellers, as opposed to what was in the consultation. <coughs> But I'm pleased to see that most of the other groups who thought they were affected then, like ramblers and other uh, uh, other people who, who use open land, um, are, are just as concerned about it as they ever were. Uh, there's a comment from Wynne Lawler, um, uh, can we look at the disconnect between the fact that in meeting the ongoing planning definition for gypsy sites, people are forced to travel and then are impacted by the fact that there are not enough stopping places that will be criminalised going forward. Um, uh, question, does the relevant highway authority have to report or advise of trespass of the highway when parked on the highway, or can it be anyone uh, if it's a public highway? Um, uh, that's, uh, I'm just scrolling down, no doubt, or you're not reading these for the first time. Um, are there any questions I'm missing here that I'm going through? Um, uh, Martin, Martin Gallagher Martin. has got his hand up, perhaps he'd oh, like to come in. Martin, while I'm looking at this, what, what's your question? Uh, cheers for the shout. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, the only thing I'm worried about is kind of a touch on Luke's comment <clears throat> regarding the police. <clears throat> um, I worked in the police headquarters. Um, I challenged the, um, the, the format of crime. Um, Record their crime recording software <clears throat> in which travelers were a crime type on that software. Um, now, um, travelers was the only ethnic group amidst every single crime that police arrest for. Um, when I challenged that, I lost my job. <clears throat> um, Cheshire, um, uh, the Jeanette McCormick said that down the line, a few years down the line, they merged, I think, with someone and um, and um, that was taken out. What I'm worried about now is if this bill comes in, will travellers go back onto that crime recording system or all crime recording systems in the UK and making us a crime type again? Because because <clears throat> I, I, I seen that with my with my own eyes. I challenged it and I came off worse because of that institutional racism. Um, you know, I, I was threatened really badly with, with, with severe punishment. Um, I'm worried now that should this bill go through, it's gonna, <clears throat> new officers who are trained on this systems, um, who have to record their crimes, will see us and will treat us and they will be in, you know, ingrained and you know, um, uh, conditioned to treat us as criminals, as cr as a crime type, because their their crime recording system says that we are, and that that's a really big, really big issue for me. So. Thank you very much. Where I've just been down, I'm sure you all have read out a lot of this and really brilliant comments there. So I, I haven't got time to to, to read all, all of out the clips here. Um, I don't know whether we can transcribe them and send them out or people can just have a look now. Um, I'm just I'm just going to ask Martin Dr. Hughes um, uh, if you just perhaps clarify what the differences are 
with the position in Scotland at the moment, and then I'll go back to, to, to Chris and the others, and then we're going to have to end. Yeah, thanks, Sandy. I, I think it's maybe important to say that in, at the moment, England and Scotland are, are very similar uh, in that trespass in both in Wales as well, the legal jurisdiction, uh, trespass is a civil wrong, but it's not a criminal act. Uh, I'm sure you all appreciate that we have an election coming up in a few weeks, uh, and that at least from my own party's position, and I think the vast majority of the parties in Holyrood at the moment, there is absolutely no plans uh, to go down the same route as the UK government. What I, I do find really concerning is some of the, the lack of communication, which clearly is through trust. And whilst it's an, an imperfect situation in Scotland, what we do see is a far more robust engagement through what we call COSLA, the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities. A really great working program between them, the Scottish Government, and also the Gypsy Traveller uh, Roma communities. So the communities are around the table, there's debate, there's discussion about how you plan for unintentioned camps or, or sites. And one of the things that really uh, I'm really glad over the last year is investment and a commitment to reopen what we call ancient sites because it's part of the story and the narrative of our nation and our country. I mean, what we call the Scots language would not be our language. Scots, for example, in the Lowlands would not exist, um, you know, uh, if it wasn't for uh, our traveller community uh, here in Scotland. So it's very much about trying to, I think, whilst we can look at the Irish approach, I do hope colleagues in the rest of the UK will look north of the border about how you create opportunities to get around the table and talk, because it's only once you start getting rid of these superficial, uh, uh, what I call historic uh, entrenchment of bigotry and racism, to start to see each other as fellow people in the journey. Uh, and it really is, it's important for us that in Scotland, that the Gypsy Travel and Roma communities are as much part of our nation's history as my family's is, being uh, from Donegal in Ireland. I think they, maybe the name gives it away. Uh, you know, so that there's huge parts of opportunities to learn about communication and building trust. It's not perfect in any shape or form, but you know, I, when we speak this afternoon, you and I both, Andy, I think, and we'll lay out in a bit more detail, there are opportunities to learn here about how we trust one another and work together and also make sure we recognise, I hope in England and Wales, that the Gypsy Travel and Roma community part are, are, are a real part of your history. And there's so much to learn by reopening sites, not by putting people into sightings and, uh, and excluding people from healthcare and participation in, in the actual state itself. It's not, it's not the way to go forward and there's huge opportunities to learn and more than happy to circulate that kind of information from the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities where all parties are represented to anyone who's interested to hear more about what we're doing uh, north of the border. Uh, thank you very much, Martin. Remember, more Martin, more Sarah, more me, for those of you who haven't had enough in the debate from 4.30 today. Chris, Chris Johnson, did you want to come back on any of the points that you've heard? Um, I'll say quickly, Andy, that there's a lot of important <laughs> questions and queries there, and I'm quite happy to, I've noted them down, and I'm quite happy to um, um, write down or uh, uh, res uh, respond my responses well, as far as I can to to those and to maybe send them to Abby and um, uh, get them circulated. Um, I don't know how long I have. I I, I can't. You're, you're, we've got minus two minutes at the moment. So yes, what, well, I, 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 what I'll do is I'll just say two things then, and then I, as I just said, I will. Um, I'll, I'll write down responses to all those important questions. First thing is, if, if our friends in Parliament uh, fail in the attempt to get rid of this offence from the new offence from the bill, uh, then when the royal when the, is given the royal assent, we will be looking to challenge it. So that would be step one. Uh, and very quickly, as an example, uh, an important point, and I. I uh, Sarah RM is very correct to say that highway is now included, unlike it wasn't included in section 61 highway, of course, a traditional stopping place, the side of the highway, like the large highway verges, and one vehicle is included. But uh, please do remember that, um, that, 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 that the problem is this, it is not an immediate criminalization of trespass. The fact that you stop by the side of the road is not, you, you are not immediately a criminal, but you can very easily be made a criminal. That's the, that's the point. Because the 
in the in the case of the, the road it will usually be the highways authority who are in charge and uh, if they decide that they're going to give you a notice on this bit of road that you stopped on this highway verge or whatever then if you don't go potentially you are a criminal there's there's the criminalization and it can happen very easily very quickly and it lasts for 12 months and i think perhaps andy as i say I, i'll write something down and send it to Abby, for all the other very important questions that were raised there. Uh, that's a very generous offer, uh, Chris. We like a bit of pro bono. And, um, uh, the, uh, and I'm sure that Abby will have that all under control and we will be able to keep in touch with the, the people who've been on the call, particularly those who joined us for the first time, and including my parliamentary colleagues. Um, Sam, did you want to add anything finally? Just to say thank you for all the comments I've, I've been. Uh, making a note as well, um, and there's some some really really useful stuff there that that we can we can think about and think about how we we can get that into the the hands of parliamentarians as well. Um, as I said, yeah, we're we're, we're going to be working uh, on the on this bill bill as a whole. The more we can um, kind of keep together the 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 why concerns about the bill. It is going to be it is it is going to be really hard to stop this legislation. Uh, the government has a, a healthy majority, but there is also a very healthy and growing opposition across civil society and across Parliament to this bill. Um, and the longer we can keep that sustained pressure, the better. Um, and as Chris said, we'll be waiting if the legislation does become law um, to challenge it in the courts as well. Thank you. Uh, Violet, did you want to give a, a final comment on what you've heard? You've Just thank you. Just thank you, really. Thank you for having me. Thank you for giving us your time to listen. Um, really appreciate it and your lovely comments. Thank you. That's, that's, that's brilliant. Thank you. We really, we could have done with the same time again. Looks like, Abby, you're going to have to organise another one of these, I'm sure. <laughs> Much a few other things you're doing. Right, I'm going to close up very finally. Um, as we've now been joined by Janet Risker, who is the, as you've heard of me, the co-chair and has been an absolute school of the, of the group for so long. Janet, do you want to say a final word before we do close the meeting? You're muted, Janet. You're still muted, Janet. Sorry, sorry. I really appreciate this meeting. I'm sorry I couldn't get here at the very beginning. What I think will be extremely useful, because there's no need to say how important all the evidence was. It really was. It was very moving. It was very trenchant. It was very much to the point. We must... We can not only use it in Parliament. People must write their MPs. They must make sure that they get more letters against than they get for it. It's only that which can put pressure onto the government. The government wants to be voted back into office, you know, and um, it's and so do MPs want to be voted back into their jobs. We must use democracy to, to get rid of this bill that means really rousing public opinion with all the extraordinarily useful evidence and testimony that we've heard this afternoon. So... Very many thanks to all the speakers. You've been of great service to our cause. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Um, it's been great to see you all. We will all keep in touch and, uh, and we will defeat this bill together. Thank you very much indeed. And bye bye.